Good morning everyone. Welcome to this new message for today. Before we begin, let's do as we usually do, commit this time to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth, absolute truth. And we pray, Father God, that you would grant your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth as we delve into your word this day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise God. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be reading from verse 18 through to verse 24. And I've called this message today, Marriage to the Death. Marriage to the Death. But before we get into the text, or read the text together, I just want to say a few things. It's been on my heart to bring a message, a sermon if you like, covering the matter of marriage for some time. However, I've, I've pondered and prayed about just how to approach this subject because it's such an important subject especially today in the world that we live. Now there are today many ideas of what marriage should be and how it should function in the modern world. In the end though, I believe that it can only be broached from the standpoint of the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. For after all, it was Almighty God himself, the everlasting Father, creator of heaven and earth and all that is in them, who ordained marriage in the first place, wasn't it? Now before we launch into our study of this subject, I think it would only be right to expose to the light just how many in this modern age view marriage. So let's begin there, shall we? Let's look at the modern or present day views of marriage, I'm speaking in general now. <clears throat> now according to the latest available research from the ONS, that's the Office for National Statistics, we see the following. There were 242,842 marriages in England and Wales in 2017. Now that's a decrease, a decrease of 2.8% from 2016. Marriage rates for opposite sex couples in 2017 were the lowest on record with 21.2 marriages per 1,000 unmarried men and 19.5 marriages per 1,000 unmarried women. Less than a quarter, that's 22% of all marriages in 2017 were religious ceremonies, the lowest percentage on record. In 2017, there were 6,932 marriages of same-sex couples, of which 56% were between female couples. A further 1,072 couples converted their existing civil partnership into a marriage. Nearly 9 in 10 or 88% of opposite sex couples cohabited before getting married in 2017. This proportion was slightly higher for couples who had a civil ceremony, that's 90%, compared with those who had a religious ceremony, 81%. The average age at marriage of opposite sex couples was 38 years for men and 35.7 years for women. These, as I've said, are the latest available figures in 2020, uh, the latest available to us from the ONS or the Office for National Statistics. 
Now these, as I've said, are official government figures. They are more or less mirrored across the West. Marriage as an institution appears to be on the decline, as may be seen by yet another ONS figure. Marriage rates for opposite sex couples are now at the lowest level on record. This continues a gradual long-term decline since the early 1970s, with numbers falling by a third over the past 40 years. As I said, these are official government figures. And yes, there are many people who do still get married. However, on average, there are at least 50% of them that will get divorced. Nevertheless, you might think that those who confess to be born again would be setting a better example than those in the world, wouldn't you? But you would be wrong. The figures for those professing to be Christians is virtually the same as those in the world, outside of any church affiliation whatsoever. There are those who do not want to be married because they see marriage as a form of bondage. They believe that being tied to one person for life under a contract, that is a, a marriage license, is too restricting. Many, including those just mentioned, want to be free to sleep around, as they say, although sleep isn't exactly what's involved, is it? What they really mean is they just want to have sex with anyone they like, any time they wish. The idea of marriage kind of gets in the way of this thinking. Brethren, this kind of mindset may be acceptable in the world but it is in no way acceptable in the church, the body of Christ. But what is it that has caused this drift away from fidelity in marriage? Well, this is what we're going to have a look at. So to begin with, we're going to look at what is and is not a marriage. <clears throat> now, I believe that there is at the root of the problem a total misconception of what marriage really is. Most, if not all people, see marriage as either a, a church wedding ceremony with a reception afterwards and then a honeymoon, if you can afford one. Others see it as having a wed wedding service anywhere, on a beach, say, or in a garden, etc., then a reception and a honeymoon. Others still see marriage as a ceremony in a registry office, as a civil service, then possibly a reception and a honeymoon. Now, if any of these scenarios, in any of these scenarios, what is required is a priest, a vicar, a pastor, and so on. In addition, in some cases, especially in a registry office, or in a service outside of a, an established church building, you need a registrar. That is, a, an official registrar to oversee the service for the civil certificate. And, of course, you need a ring or two. Now, this is what is widely seen and accepted as getting married, even by those within the body of Christ. I think, brethren, that many, if not most of you, will agree with that. But how does the Bible describe marriage? How does God view marriage? For as I said at the beginning, it was Almighty God, the creator of all things, who instituted marriage in the first place, wasn't it? Now, surely you might say the Bible says what we've just described, doesn't it? Well, no, actually it doesn't. So I think that we'd better have a look at what it does say about marriage. 
So to remind ourselves, most people would say that it is the actual ceremony that makes you a man and wife. Let's go right back to the beginning of the Bible to see just what Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth and all that is in them, has to say on this subject of marriage. Please now turn with me to the following passage of Scripture that we mentioned at the beginning. It's Genesis chapter 2. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to read from verse 18 to verse 24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 24. Verse 18 of Genesis 2. And let's read together. <clears throat> and the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every creature, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmate for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. I want you to underline those last words and they shall be one flesh because that we will see as important as we go through this message and they shall be one flesh. Now here in this passage of scripture in the Old Testament right at the beginning of Genesis we see that after God had created man, Adam, he brought before him every creature that he might name them. God also did this to make Adam realise that none of them would be a suitable helpmate for him, but that he would need someone else, someone of his own kind, someone of his own species, as it were. Now the word help, as we see there where it says help meet. The word help is the Hebrew word aidzer, aidzer, and it means an aid, a help. It's pretty simple, isn't it? An aid, a help. Whereas the words meet for him, meet for him, are just one Hebrew word, and that Hebrew word is neged, neged which means a counterpart, a mate. So a helpmate for him would be an aide or a help who is a counterpart, a mate for Adam. Now notice what God says next. When a help cannot be found for Adam from among all the creatures that have already been created and brought before him to name, God causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. In other words, in, in modern terms, God puts Adam under ready for an operation. In this operation, God removes one of Adam's ribs, an actual rib. Now the word rib, that there are many versions of this. Some say a side out of Adam, some say a a piece of his psyche or whatever, but the word rib here in the authorised version 
is the Hebrew word, it's translated from the Hebrew word, tsela, tsela, which means an actual rib, as curved, literally of the body. And that's from the Hebrew dictionary. A rib as curved, literally, of or from the body. So it was an actual rib that God removed from Adam, bone from his bone and flesh from his flesh. So then God takes this rib from Adam whilst he is in a deep sleep. And after closing up the incision, he makes from it a counterpart, help of him, for him, sorry, of his own species. God makes another being from this rib from Adam of his own species. This counterpart being called woman, or as the Hebrew is called, Isha, Ishasha, Ishasha, which means a woman, female, opposite to man. God makes an opposite of Adam from his own flesh and blood and bone as a helpmeet for him. Now after making that clear, upon recovering from his operation, that is Adam, the woman is brought to Adam by God. And Adam, not God, Adam says the following. Genesis chapter 2 Verses 23 to 24. This is not God now. This is Adam speaking. How do we know? Well, it says so. Because in verse 23, it says this. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone. Talking of the woman. This is now bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Adam, of course, speaking about Eve. Now I'd like you to notice that Adam here realises that God has made this woman from his rib because he says this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh or if you like bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh he that is Adam knows that this creature that God has made is now of his own species because she was made of him and for him I'd like you also to notice what Adam says next in, in verse 24. He is now speaking of future generations. He's not speaking of himself because this is already, this is already coming to pass. He's speaking in a future tense to future generations or in other words about his children and their children and so on future generations what he says is that from then onward from this creation of woman a man would leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife now and cleave unto the words and cleave unto are translated from the Hebrew word dabak, dabak, which, which means to impinge or to cling to, to catch fast, to cleave unto, to be joined together, to stick together. Now I'd like you to notice the words be joined together in what I've just said as the description of this word dabak, be joined together. 
In the definition we just read, it becomes vital in the understanding of what Adam said in the last part of verse 24, that part that I asked you to underline, and they shall be one flesh. When Adam said that upon leaving father and mother, the man and woman would become one flesh. This means that the man and the woman must come together in a sexual union. In other words, the man must go into the woman to produce children. Let me explain. Now, whereas the woman was made from a rib taken out of man, to become one flesh, they must come together physically to produce an offspring. And this is what happens, isn't it? When you're born again, God comes into you and a new man is created. This is a type, a type and a shadow of, of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's precious, it's special, it's incredible. And I'll repeat it again. This means that the man and the woman must come together in sexual union, physical sexual union. In other words, the man must go into the woman to produce offspring, to produce children. It is therefore this coming together physically which is considered by God to be a marriage. This coming together is the consummation of the marriage. In this the man becomes a father and the woman becomes a mother. From then onward their children would perpetuate the institution of marriage. This was and still is the purest and holy means of the procreation of our species which God both intended and expects from his people. Now what we've seen, what we've seen uh, just is what marriage is and what marriage is not. Let's look at the happiness of man or the glory of God. The happiness of man or the glory of God. Now after the fall from grace, through the sin of disobedience to God and his word, all of the attitudes of mankind changed, both in Adam and Eve and throughout all their offspring to today. The attitudes towards marriage and its physical intimacy was one of them. The desire to love, honour, and to be a mate for life, as it were, with the one to whom you wish to become one flesh with for a lifetime, morphed into rather a desire to satisfy the desires of the flesh and to be happy. To please oneself by the pleasures of the flesh, in other words. Now the original Israelite marriage, Jewish marriage, was one that consisted of several stages and those stages are as follows. There are three stages. You may have heard of these before but forgive me for repeating them. First of all was the negotiation of a match between two families, an arranged marriage. This included a price to be paid to the future bride's father by the father of the groom or the prospective groom. This price was called the mohar, the mohar. Secondly, there was the betrothal. This betrothal or arusin is where the bride and the groom were bound legally in marriage. An agreement was signed and sealed. by word of mouth or otherwise. The bride, however, would continue to live 
with her own family for a period of about one year until the official wedding ceremony. And it would be during this period of around a year that the groom would prepare a new home for his bride. And thirdly and finally was the wedding ceremony or the Nisuin. Nisuin. This was a formal ceremony that took place beneath a chupa or a canopy. It was during this betrothal period, if you remember, that Mary or Miriam, as her Hebrew name was, was found to be pregnant with Jesus, Yeshua. As such, Joseph would have been within his rights to divorce her for infidelity. However, he was prevented by the intervention of the Holy Spirit in a dream from doing so. In scripture, which is inspired by God himself, we read the following. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 I've just stated that all scripture is inspired by God himself and we must prove this from scripture 1 Timothy chapter 3 16 says this all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness. So we can agree that all scripture is inspired by God himself. And in this scripture, we see that the only reason acceptable to God for a divorce is sexual immorality, adultery. And here is some scriptural proof of what I've just said. Turn with me, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. God the Father here, writing a bill of divorce for the nation of Israel, whom he considered to be his bride. Because of their adultery, their dealings with the religious ways and the, of the surrounding pagan nations around them. He wrote them a bill of divorce. He stood, he stepped away from them, in other words. And the following is a question by the Pharisees to Jesus about this matter of divorce. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19, if you will. Matthew chapter 19. We've just read that God himself, God the Father, wrote a bill of divorcement as such about against the nation of Israel, his chosen people, for their sin. Now we read, following a question by the Pharisees to Jesus about the matter of divorce, the following. Matthew chapter 19, verse 7. Matthew chapter 19, verse 7, through to chapter 9. Verse 7. They, that is the Pharisees, said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? To, and to put her away, sorry. So let's now see what the answer that Jesus, the Son of God, gave to them. The question was, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Jesus answered in verse 8 and 9 the following. Verse 8. He saith unto them, that is Jesus, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, 
suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whoever, whoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whomsoever marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So then, Jesus himself does accept that divorce is permitted by God. We can agree on that. However, what is divorce and what is it really for? Is it so that one is allowed to go off and remarry someone else? This is what happened in, in, uh, in Jesus' day. It's what happened in the days before him. And it's what happens today also, isn't it? So let's begin right at the beginning and look at the seventh commandment. Let's look at the seventh commandment. Can you remember what that one is? Well, if you can't, turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. Let's read together verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now the word translated for us into English as adultery is the Hebrew word na'af. Na'af, which means to commit adultery, figuratively to apostatize, to commit adultery, a woman or a man that breaks wedlock, a woman or a man that breaks wedlock, or it can also mean to apostatize from the faith. But in the marriage, it means a man and a woman or a woman that breaks the agreement of wedlock. Now, as we saw with God and the nation of Israel, the betrayal of the relationship with God by pagan nations and their ways, etc., was considered by God to be adultery. So also in a marriage, where either the man or the woman enters into a sexual relationship in any way, whether it be a one-off or a long-term relationship, this is considered adultery. This is made clear by Jesus himself. Turn with me please, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. To see what Jesus himself, the Son of the living God, says about this matter. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 5 beginning at verse 31. It hath been said, Jesus himself speaking here, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, that is divorce, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, that's adultery, causeth her to commit adultery. And whomsoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now if you, if you don't understand or believe that text, turn with me to Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus again speaks on this subject. Clearly, Matthew chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. Matthew 19 verse 8 says this he saith that is jesus he saith unto them moses because of the hardness of your hearts suffered you to put away your wives but from the beginning it was not so and i say unto you whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marries her, which is put away, doth commit adultery also. 
Now in both cases, in both cases, Jesus brings up the matter of remarriage after divorce. Entering in to another relationship with someone else after divorce. This was a relevant matter then, and it is most certainly a relevant matter today, especially, sadly, in the church. But why? As we saw right at the start of this message, the incidents of divorce in the church virtually mirror those in the world, outside of any religious affiliation or belief whatsoever. This shows, at least to me, and hopefully to you, that there is a great misunderstanding of both what marriage is and also divorce within what is called the body of Christ. And this, I believe, is due to a lack of teaching or even wrong teaching on the subject of marriage. Now Jesus himself reveals the true heart of God on the matter of marriage and divorce here in the following scripture. We're going to read again from Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. We're going to read from verse 3, which we read before, through to verse 6, six though, this time. Matthew 19, verse 3 to verse 6, if you will. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, that is Jesus, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause shall man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. There's that one flesh again. Wherefore they are no more twain or two but one flesh. This is the important part and please un underline it in your Bible. What therefore God hath joined together let no man put asunder. I'll repeat it. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And if you are married, many of you who are married, got married in church, this would have been part of your marriage vows. Therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Now here, in these final words is a very crux of the matter. Brethren, the coming together as one flesh. Now this joining together as one flesh seals the bond between both man and woman in marriage and also between them and God for life. Nevertheless, what about divorce? Well, yes, as we've read before, God does indeed allow for divorce. He doesn't like it, but he allows it. He didn't intend it from the beginning, but he allowed it because of the hardness of people's hearts between the married couple. However, this was not and should never be the end of the marriage. That cannot come until the death of one of the parties, till death do you part. You pledge that before God. And this is all sealed by the coming together in the flesh. The divorce was given as a means of giving both parties a period of time to sort out their problems and then to bring them to God in repentance and forgiveness back into the unity of that marriage. Let me repeat, divorce 
was given as a means of giving both parties a period of time to sort out their problems, to bring them to God in prayer, in repentance and forgiveness. This was the case between God and Israel. Why? Because God didn't go off and pick another nation to call his own, did he? He awaits patiently for the time when Israel will have their eyes opened and repent and come back to him. This is still his desire over his people. They never fail to be God's chosen people. So it is between the man and the woman who have been joined together as one flesh. What is between God and Israel is a type and a shadow of the marriage. But as we've seen, today in supposed modern times, so-called enlightened times, marriage as an institution has lost its attraction with many just living together as so-called common law partnerships or something else. Either this or just sleeping around with anyone to whom a person may fancy. Here comes the crunch though. It is, as we have seen, the being joined together as one flesh in which, which in God's eyes seals the marriage. It is what is the marriage. It is the very act of sexual intercourse, not an actual marriage certificate or a service. Because even if, he's, if one is legally married in the eyes of the state and yet no sexual intercourse takes place to consummate the marriage, it can be annulled by law. This then causes a very great problem for all of those who think it perfectly acceptable to sleep around. I'm not just talking about in the world now. God will judge them anyway. And we were there once. But I'm speaking about in what's called the church, the body of Christ, it now causes a very great problem for anyone who believes they are born again, part of the body of Christ, who think it perfectly acceptable to sleep around, whether you be man or woman, because they don't want to be tied down by a marriage, a certificate, a ceremony. The problem is, that the first person, the man or the woman, may have sexual intercourse with is, in God's eyes, their wife or their husband. They are married, they've become one flesh. So any other person slept with or had sex with, we should say, means that they've already committed adultery in the eyes of God. They will therefore have to answer to God for this adultery at the time of the judgment. This stands, whether in the church or in the world, for God is the God of all. What thou of divorce in the body of Christ? I've already set off a bomb, as it were, to all those who think it acceptable to sleep around in the body of Christ. But now what of divorce in the body of Christ? This matter unfortunately has caused much, much trouble in the body of Christ, in the church. Again, because of either bad teaching or lack of teaching. The answer is quite simple really. If one was divorced before salvation, there is no problem. This is because upon salvation, one has died 
and been raised to newness of life in Christ. You have become a new creation, so death has nullified the marriage. It is under the blood of Christ. Read with me, if you will, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if you don't believe me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, or woman, he or she is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Underline all things. Because if it says all things are become new, it means all things are become new. Because you are now a new creature, a new creation, a new species. Whereas if one becomes divorced after salvation, it should only be for a period of reflection. It doesn't nullify the marriage because you are one flesh. You have become one flesh, inseparable. What God has put together, let no man put asunder. The end result of the separation being the reconciliation of both as one, once again. Divorce then and remarriage to another would result in adultery and does result in adultery. If you have been divorced after you have been saved and you have married another, you have committed adultery in the eyes of God. That's not me accusing you. This is the word of God. And if you believe the word of God, then this is what it means. Let's read again from Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. I cannot make this any clearer from the word of God. I cannot reiterate it more because it's so important to the life of the believer. Matthew chapter 19 verse 5 and said for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. They twain shall be one flesh. Those two shall be one flesh. Wherefore, verse 6, they are no more twain, no more two individuals, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Excuse me. Let none man put asunder. Well, this has been a hard message to bring. But let's bring it to a conclusion. As I stated at the beginning of this message, the idea and importance of marriage in the church has to a great extent been lost. This is mainly due to, as I have said, to either bad teaching or to no teaching at all. This has allowed ideas the ideas and the ways of the world to easily infiltrate the body of Christ and the individual believer. Brethren, this is a situation that can no longer be allowed to continue because if there is sin in the camp, there will not be any presence of God. Let me repeat, if there is sin in the camp, there will not be and cannot be any presence of God. Certainly no presence of the Holy Spirit. However, it is something that can be easily rectified by conviction of sin, repentance of sin, by those involved in the sin. But hearts must be convicted by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit bringing conviction and the ability, the facility to repent of that sin by those involved 
in the sin. This though can only happen if the unchanging word of God is both preached and taught from the pulpits of this nation and other nations. The word of God is very clear on the matters of both marriage and divorce. If you would just read it. Therefore, it is both preached and taught from pulpits, the Holy Spirit will most certainly do his work of conviction of sin where it occurs. For as you should know, the work of the Holy Spirit is as follows, brother. And turn with me to John 16. John 16. Just a few more scriptures before we close. John 16, verses 13 to 11. John 16, verses 13 and 15. Sorry. How be it, John 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Again, let's look at John 16, verse 7 to 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged or has been judged. Brothers and sisters, I hope most sincerely and pray most sincerely that this message will bring some clarity to this extremely important matter of marriage and divorce. I encourage you to study the scriptures that we've read today, mentioned in their context over and over until things become clear in your minds. Bring these things to the Lord in your times of prayer. For we have much help in the form of the Holy Spirit to aid us. So brethren, until the next time that we meet, may God richly bless and keep each and every single one of you. In Jesus' name. Amen.